<laughs> Good morning and welcome. Um, you're here today at the session Digital Inclusion, the Correction System, and Returning Residents. Uh, we thank you for making time to join us today. Uh, during the next 55 minutes or so, we will attempt to do several things. One is to give you uh, some insights into what uh, uh, people returning to the community face when trying to reintegrate into society where technology is used for all sorts of activities from the most mundane to the most uh, important. Um, and then we will open it up to the audience for some questions. Um, and yeah, any questions before we get started? Awesome. All right, so to start, I'm gonna let my uh, panelists introduce themselves. I want you to let the audience know who you are and what makes you, uh, what puts you in a position to, to speak on, on the topic of uh, returning citizens uh, and digital inclusion. I'll go first. Uh, hey everyone, how you doing? My um, name is Jonathan Alvarez from Yonkers, New York. Um, I'm co-founder and executive director of 914 United. We are a program-based mentoring organization working with justice-involved individuals, primarily the youth. Um, a key component of the work that we do is a re-entry mentoring, either one-on-one -on -one or group with the detention centers, and also information-based programming, such as financial literacy, civic engagement, and a host of other things. Um, as of August 2021, we partnered with STEM Alliance, uh, shout out to Meg in the audience, where we're now providing digital literacy programming to returning citizens. Um, so I'm here to speak on behalf of two different perspectives, um, my lived experience as a formerly incarcerated person, and also as a practitioner in the field. Thank you. Hello, my name is Quentin. I am recently released from prison. I did um, about 119 months, and so my perspective comes strictly from a lived experience and in a small bit of working in the field with regards to uh, community-based participatory research in an, in an effort to uh, shrink the hold that the justice system or the injustice system, as I like to call it, has on uh, uh, the community of, of color and the BIPOC community in general. So, um, thank you. Hi, my name is Alyssa. Um, I am also speaking today from lived experience. Um, I released from prison a year ago. Um, so definitely like have quite a bit of experience with struggling with technology. Um, I am also a co-founder of an education program that brought um, higher ed into the prison that I was at. Um, and so definitely speaking from the perspective of the power of education and knowledge to um, help and to aid and assist in successful reentry. Great, thank you all. Uh, in a moment we'll talk about your interactions with uh, digital technologies in the community, but before starting there, I wanted to take a step back. So, and if you can think back to your, the months before you returned to the community, what were your interactions with uh, digital technologies? What sort of technologies did you use? How did you use them? Um, how did the uh, institutions that you were incarcerated in um, mediate your use of those devices? Uh, I guess I'll go first again. Um, so the advantage I had before my release was that um, I, I was in a college program called Bard Prison Initiative. I was in that program for five years. Um, so I served 13 years in state prison, and in New York, they have this college program for, it's a liberal arts college program that focuses on like, you know, computing skills and also just liberal arts studies. Um, I was in a bachelor's program, so we had to use the computer lab. We had access to a computer lab. But that only equipped me with understanding how to use Microsoft, you know, write essays and do research on like a limited archive. Um, but coming home, I had the advantage to articulate myself via emails and stuff like that, but I never really knew how to navigate certain softwares or apps. Um, so coming home, um, the support I had from family and friends, a friend of mine bought me a PC. And then from there, I just was like strictly gonna use it to apply for a master's program and also just to send, you know, use Gmail. But as you know, you play with the computer, you kind of learn, but I still, even to this day, being home three years, um, I'm still learning, for example, how to book a flight to Portland. <laughs> There's certain <laughs> things that I have trouble with that my girlfriend helps me with. So no matter how acquainted you can be with a computer, being locked out of digital education for so long, you know, um, you always at some kind of handicap, right? You're at a disadvantage. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. 
So uh, my interactions with technology was, so we have a JPEG and that was, or a JPEG computer, which is just a device or a computer that allows you to communicate with the outside world via email and things and send pictures back and forth. And so in terms of any real application with updated software or applications in, in that regard, there was, there was absolutely zero. And so uh, after doing 10 years, you know, obviously there's, you know, they say technology doubles every two years. So you can only imagine where I, where I you know, was a sidekick when I was out and then it turned into an iPhone <laughs> 11. And so um, not only, you know, navigating that is a definitely difficult, but and trying not to become a burden on everybody else and walking around like a walking issue. Like, I don't know how to do this. And then you just like you know, closed out. But so it was, it was definitely a difficult transition. And like you said, it, it continues to be, uh, especially when you need 170 passwords uh, to get on different platforms or every so. And it's just, uh, yeah. So. Thank you, Q. Yeah. Um, so I had the privilege of learning how to code right before I released. I spent the last year that I was inside um, learning that. However, it's on a completely closed circuit. So we had zero internet access. Um, like even, I went to prison in 2004, like the internet obviously existed, but not in any way of how it exists now. Um, and so having no idea, even learning to say write code and create a website, not actually knowing how websites work or like how to navigate those types of things, like it, it's like giving you knowledge and being completely limited in the application of that. Um, and also like Q mentioned, we had JPEG devices that are like the most rudimentary things when you think compared to say your iPhone. Um, so you have an idea that you send like mail out into the universe, but there's not like, again, a conception of how that functions or how you know, and because JPEG is so limited, it's also like a closed circuit. They say you have Wi-Fi, but it's really not Wi-Fi as you all think of and enjoy it. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot of limitations and restrictions surrounding that. Great, uh, thank you for, uh, for describing your access while incarcerated. Um, just to highlight, right, so uh, Jonathan mentioned that he was part of a, of a, of a educational program, and so he had uh, appeared greater access uh, to technology and, and training, um, and that's pretty consistent across uh, uh, prisons uh, in, in the United States. Um, if you're in education programs, you, you're more likely to have access, but it's usually going to be on, uh, like, word processing applications and less on, um, like, social media or searching and evaluating resources. Um, or um, using different devices. So, so now we've talked about what it was like when you were incarcerated. In most uh, U.S. prison systems, there is a reentry process. Um, and as part of the reentry process, you usually are developing, you have to with your, uh, d develop a plan about what you're, what you're going to do once you get released. Did any part of your reentry plan talk about um, equipping, equipping you with, with technology or setting aside time in addition to all of the other things they want you to do to go and, and get training or, or anything like that? Um, I, I will tackle that first only because I think if we're thinking about the way that technology is viewed inside of the like carceral state, it's seen as a threat. And so any sort of empowerment or knowledge surrounding that is always going to come up against opposition when it comes to like administration and the idea of safety and security inside of the prison. Um, and so like th getting out and thinking about how could I learn how to utilize this, like it, no education is actually going to offer something fruitful if it's DOC led or organized. Um, that idea definitely has to come from somewhere else and it has to be given as like a radical and somehow posed like safe option mm -hmm. to preparing people for release um, when you're going to be reliant on technology. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, um, I could just, you know, second that notion with the idea that a lot of the corrections are real security minded. So, you know, everything that you're trying to do to empower yourself is definitely some kind of threat. Um, so the one thing that worked for me before my release was individuals who had some knowledge with, you know, 
Google Slides or Excel spreadsheets that I went to individually. Um, and that's just kind of like what birthed my passion to do this work um, with reentry because it's up to, uh, up to other individuals with the information to, you know, pave the way forward. So I had that advantage being in a college setting um, with individuals with some information. They might have been Google, you know, Google nerds before the incarceration that I used for the information to help prepare for me. But in New York State, they have something called transitional services, and that's very ineffective. Um, it's supposed to transition you and make you think about certain things like job search and resumes, but it's facilitated by people who are disconnected, and they don't have that component because of the security threat that you know uh, access to um, digital devices can supposedly propose. So, um, yeah, it's not necessarily offered, and I think that that's one of my long-term visions for New York State and hopefully nationally is to provide some way bringing digital education in that transitional service component um, facilitated by individuals with lived experiences, you know, so that it's something coming from a real perspective. And yeah. All right, thank you, John. Thank you. Would you like to add anything? Uh, so, in releasing, there is absolutely nothing that they do to prepare you technologically. Not one thing. I don't, we didn't talk about it, and there was never a conversation about what I would do getting out. With that, and so they do in Washington State. We do have this thing called a release plan, and they make you fill this out. And I mean, it's like you have to fill it out, or you run the risk of not and pushing your ERD back to your earned release date. Um, and so I did that, you know, very diligently. And then, and when I got out, um, I showed my DOC officer, and he didn't even grab it, mm. didn't even touch it. So it's really a formality in a sense, and to make the system look like it's doing something, but they're really offering no tools. Um, okay. I believe. Right. So, um, in summary, it sounds like uh, there was not much a conversation held about how or, or how you would access or use or learn how to use technology at post-release. So, uh, I want you to think of your first, one of your first interactions with a digital tool or digital service after you return to the community. Can you describe that and um, how did that feel? Uh, what was it that you were trying to accomplish? I, I think for me it was, um, I got out, right? Yeah, so it was Zoom actually. And so um, I was actually kind of frustrated. I get frustrated even when I can't, because when something makes me feel like I'm not bright enough then I'm like, I'm kind of mad. So it was just logging into a basic Zoom meeting. like, And so I see all these links, and I'm like, I start clicking the phone numbers, and I'm like, well, what's going on? Here? And so I'm stuck there for like 30 minutes, and I'm mad, going back, refreshing. But anyways, um, the fact that I couldn't access a Zoom meeting and was huge, and now, especially looking back, like it's really kind of simple. But when mm -hmm. you don't have the information or the know-how, then it can be incredibly frustrating, which can you know, you can see this in different areas, but people tend to go back to what they know, and when times get harder, they can't figure something out. So that was, uh, that was an issue for me. Right. Thank you, Q. Uh, On a basic level, um, because I had access to computers inside, uh, sorry. me was uh, the iPhone, like learning my iPhone, right? You know, navigating Instagram, um, trying to access my bank account that my friend opened up for me before returning home. Very difficult. I'm sometimes always asking questions about that. So it was dealing with things that I felt I was either interested in or that I needed. Okay. Oh, and Alyssa? Yeah, I would just say paralysis is like a really good way of describing that. I just remember looking at my phone and like not, my daughter had given me her like Google Pixel and I was like, I don't even know where to start on here, how to make a phone call. Like, mm. Like it takes time, so I just remember like at one point like crying, not being able to access a menu in a restaurant on that first day, not understanding like how mm. something that seems so simple like functions, um, and needing and having to actually like verbally say I need some time where you guys don't bother me, mm. so that I can just like look at my phone and kind of figure it out because I'm expected to like do everything and like you're waiting in line at the store and you're so nervous because you might have to use your phone for something. Um, it's those moments, like I said, it just felt paralyzing to be in that space and not know how to use the things and everybody's looking at you like just you just do it. Mm -hmm. It's not that simple. Okay. All right. Thank you for sharing uh, that, um, all three of you. So. I asked you to describe just one challenge. I imagine that you, you face many challenges um, learning how to use technology and even using technology probably up to today. Uh, I know even 
many seasoned users of technology uh, do as well. Can you talk about, uh, particularly around the time that you um, returned to the community, who were some of the the resources that you turned to, uh, people in your circles, um, organizations? Like, who? How did you? How did you navigate those challenges? How did you get past paralysis? Right? How did you? Um, uh, Q, learn about how to use uh, Zoom and, and other relevant technologies? Um, so, actually, mine was after I got a hold of myself, it was kind of easy because on a, I was part of a program called Post Prison Education, so I got my AA in prison in. And then when I kind of got like a navigator, she like, she, A, she helped me enroll in the UW, I go to UW, and so then I just had so many questions, and so she kind of helped walk me through things of that nature. And then I just, um, I also asked questions. My, my friend did 24 years and he's an executive director of a company. And so he had been out for two years. So then I would turn to him because then it's, it's a lot easier to turn to somebody without having to explain, you know, why I'm having trouble or the difficulty. So he, are, he understood. And so that's my avenue I took. Great. Thank you, Q. And I also want to note he said um, that he worked with a navigator. He kind of mumbled the last portion, which was that he's currently enrolled at the University of Washington. So I want to make sure. We, uh, we, we get that in there. Okay, go ahead, Alyssa. Um, I, so it's the same for me, like having specifically, like my daughter was very helpful and she was like my, my attached to my hip my first week out. So like every question I had, she was very patient to, um, to help me with. But it was really like I had and, and have a few formerly incarcerated friends who it's that same thing, like, being able to ask somebody questions who has already like struggled through this and gets it and doesn't think that you're weird for not knowing how to do things and can also like warn you of the pitfalls that I think being an adult and like tackling social media and technology like I think it's very easy to fall into like pitfalls of like clicking and not knowing where you're going um, and where that might lead and like the dangers of social media and in many ways, especially being a systems impacted person um, that my daughter could not have foreseen or, you know, it's just not something that is her lived experience and she wouldn't have thought of it. Um, so while she could help me navigate, like my, my formerly incarcerated network was the most helpful. Great, thank you. And uh, I wanted to tweak the question a little bit for you, uh, Jonathan, because I know you have an, uh, you're a service provider as well, um, and so you're wearing that hat. Uh, with the people that you engage with, what are some of the challenges you see them facing, and, and um, do you see them ever, like when they get frustrated, uh, what do you do to help them continue to, to be hopeful about being able to learn how to use it and use, use technology? Uh, um, efficiently and effectively. I mean, um, the main challenge is is just human basic needs. Um, that is before the digital education. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes these individuals are facing you know uh, housing issues, mm -hmm. right? They're living in shelters. Um, they in a halfway house, coming home from a federal prison. Mm -hmm. Um, trying to navigate uh, transport to our program. Mm -hmm. They can't make it on time. Um, parole stipulations mm -hmm. is a real big one. Um that compromised the first cohort. So we've done two cohorts with STEM Alliance successfully, and a lot of the challenges that we learned was the parole, for example, right? Program started at six in person, the half house is in the Bronx, which is a whole nother town over, and they can't make it on time because their parole officer would not let them, right? So battling with the parole system has been one big obstacle. And then outside of that, human needs. You know, I try to offer these options, you know, to educate the mind, but if you're not feeding the body, like literally, how can they focus on that? Um, on my way over here, so one individual I've been trying to get in the program, served over 25 years, um, I helped him get a job, uh, I put him in therapy, I gave him access to that, and he still was looking for housing. He finally found an apartment, and the first thing he said was, now I could take a digital literacy program, mm. right? Like, you have to service those things first before thinking about providing them other things. Great, right, thank you. Thank you. I have a few more questions here, but I, I want to open it up to, to the audience. There, if you have a question, um, you can stand up if you speak at the mic because there's people who's watching from home or their office and we want to make sure they can, they can hear your question. Hi. First off, thank you so much. This has been super fascinating. Um, my question is, I, I briefly talked with the juvenile detention centers in Oregon about doing a program that is run by 
Amazon that's focused on like somewhat early career, not early career, but early education, like stepping into technology. It sounds somewhat like what you had talked about for coding. And it never occurred to me, right, that some of this would be seen as a risk mm. and that there was this threat. So I, I struggled because I was like, why are you not more interested in this? Mm. Like, this is free. This is an opportunity. It's like really easy to use. You don't have to do anything. Mm. So my question is, what do you think that we can do to help change that mindset of risk and fear of the technology? Because that seems like the first step in order to improve is to take away some of that fear from the correction system. Uh, I don't, oh, real quick, your name and organization? Oh, um, I'm Vina, and I am involved with DIN, which is the local digital inclusion network. Thank you. Uh, I, I think many people have tried to quell that fear, but the reality is, is um, the only way it's gonna they're gonna change is if they want to, and and if they really want to make things better. There's there's really no effort to make things better because if there was, then things would be different. So, uh, but for me, the internet seems like something that will be of great value to any prison, but until like you can at least satisfy firewalls and things that they say are going to be potential issues because the truth is they don't want you broadcasting what's really going on behind the walls. So until you can until you can prove that you can stop uh, unchecked messages and, and communication from going out, uh, then they're never going to bring down the wall, which is, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the reality, in my opinion. And just to piggyback on that, so Washington did pass, um, I don't know if it, if it was like policy, so there was supposed to be like a closed network internet um, like access offered at Washington Correction Center for Women that was particularly tied to the coding program. Um, and in so many ways it was blocked at the... Um, just at the local level at the prison um, so that we never actually got to access it. So even though there was a, a change that said, yes, this will be offered, it, it has yet to actually be offered. So thinking about making changes like at the state legislative level, and then there has to be follow-up that says, is this being implemented? Somebody's checking. There has to be accountability. And that takes the community saying, we're invested in this. We don't see this as a danger. Like, how do you reframe corrections? And mm -hmm. you have to get the community kind of on board to support such changes. And that is like broad, right? Because that can be on the left side or the right side, right? Mm -hmm. Because of the way that, that corrections are viewed. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to just champion to say, say the same thing, so. OK, cool. Um, so just to summarize that, it, it sounds like um, what I'm hearing is that one, there needs to be uh, the prisoners need to feel like there's an incentive, like uh, to to making access available and training available, and two, um, if all lawmakers are going to put in place uh, policies or recommendations about access, then then they need to um, put some teeth behind there, right? like follow up with it, make sure it's getting um, applied or, or followed. Um, and so what I wanted to say actually about Washington State, so for better or for worse, Washington State is actually considered uh, above the, uh, excuse me, ahead of the curve in terms of making technology uh, accessible um, when compared to uh, many uh, other states. That being said, we have two people here that were at, at Washington State Correctional uh, Facilities. Uh, it sounds like they still have a, a lot of work left to do. Um, are there any other questions? at this time before, okay. Hi, I'm Gina with Mobile Citizen, and I'm wondering if you all can speak a little bit about your experiences or opportunities for change and differences across the federal versus state and county. Mm -hmm. And then also there's a lot of, I know, uh, halfway houses or that are part of transitioning. Uh, can you... I kind of identify like maybe your individual experiences as well as areas that we 
as a country could perhaps uh, look at and uh, for you know changing and addressing these issues um I'm going to just kind of like repeat what I said in my last comment. Um, so in some sense, I was really happy to see yesterday that um, the broadband has $65 billion right, being invested into it. But part of me was kind of like scared at the same time because it took us so long to get there. And at the same time, we still have human needs that's not being met. Like why is not mental health and housing right next to that $65 billion? Mm -hmm. So on the national level, we need to start putting money, changing policies to fund things that are the root cause analysis to crime, poverty, right, economic opportunities. You know, I'm real big on digital education. I'm a proponent, obviously, but again, on a national level, federal, state, on all levels, we need to figure out how do we address the core needs of the people that we're getting funded for. And what scares me is that a lot of organizations, they're getting paid for the process, not progress. You know, and I emphasize that for a reason, because I'm seeing it as a community leader running my nonprofit and seeing what's really going on here. So. I gave you an example of a client. He had real issues that I could not address. So housing is one of the biggest things we need to focus on so we could put the computer in it first. <laughs> like we have to work on those things. Um, and that's just one thing that I really want to see. Like that $65 billion, I was happy to see that we got really far, but it also scared me to see that as a country, you know, this is where we at now and we're still neglecting other areas. And I'm gonna emphasize one thing I talked about earlier with somebody in the um, kitchen hall, whatever I was at. And it's, we need a more holistic approach, right? Right, so I said so my organization, the key component I mentioned was re-entry mentoring, right? You ask the question, how do we help our clients? Supportive counseling, right? Mm -hmm. um, coordinating services that this person needs on many different levels. So we need to start having organizations collaborate so we can provide a whole package, right? You know, housing, mental health, economic opportunities, programming, personal development, and then digital uh, uh, education. As a, we need to have all organizations doing that because what I'm noticing is that most organizations are in the same race by themselves and they're real individualistic. They're not taking on a collective approach, right? Because they're trying to get to their money, their funding, so they're focused on their numbers, right? But then it's actually just looking at tech. But what about these other things that if you was to collaborate, you can bring together as a holistic approach so that you can service that one person effectively. You know, so we here just chasing, trying to get money for tech education, but we're not thinking about people dying from gun violence, poverty, homelessness. There's so many things going on now. When I seen that number, I kind of got scared and in the sense that I think that as practitioners, professionals, academics, we're almost living in a, like a, a self-deception in, in, in a sense, like a false reality of things because there's real things that we need to address. And you could tell I'm passionate because I'm coming from that, right? And I'm dealing with these people or my people in a day-to-day. -day, so you know, just need to change the perspective of how funding is, is being distributed, you know, and again, let's, in, let's emphasize the collective approach over individualism, right? Let's emphasize collaboration and, um, you know, not put competition over community. Mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a broad sense, that I mean, you can't really say any, any different than that, but in a more, uh, you know, concise manner is that, um, on the basic level, like you said, if you ask any prisoner that's trying to do something with their lives, or anybody that's been incarcerated, right? It's like they we all understand that housing is the first thing, and then a job. So if you, like me, I got out, they gave me three months voucher to live in a transitional house, which is a room with another man. Um, it's like a prison cell, and so our um, feet were like this far apart. So the reality is, you want a space that allow a person a space to think. I can't even think in this space. I can't listen to him. I'm, I'm, on a, I'm in class, I got my roommate right here. He's trying to watch TV, I'm trying to do work, I'm trying to listen and work. So the, so the housing is important, but also the job in the, in the most strict sense because uh, I got family members that have been out for years and they're still not catching on because they don't have an opportunity to gain meaningful employment. Um, you, you're going to pay somebody, they say, oh, we, we'll give you $15 an hour, and that may seem like a lot to a lot of people, but to live in Seattle with them is ridiculous. So, you know, I'm paying $1,600 for one bedroom, and now you're looking like, well, my $15 an hour is, is gone. I make 2100 after taxes. So it's like um, housing and employment that matters on a basic level. And um, like he said, there's just a lot of people that are doing a lot that aren't really doing much. They're saying a lot. There's, you know, oh, we're doing this for the community, we're doing this, but the reality is like DLC does. They say they're doing a lot, but when you really look at it and you, all you got to do is go to the ground level and see what they say. They're going to say they're not doing nothing. And the same thing goes on this side. So.
just one just one small addition to that is like thinking so we think so much in the nonprofit sector right so many of the services that are offered to as reentry services um, as community support like the first question you ask when you want to do that work is how will we get funding right and so everybody thinks of these finite resources that are nonprofits, right? How, how do we get funding? If I get funding, then that takes funding away from you. Like, what does that look like? So it creates that competition rather than looking at the idea of like mutual aid, like there doesn't have to necessarily be the legitimacy if there are smaller organizations that are willing to like work and be that support that there's ways of like creating like you mentioned that holistic idea of taking care of people but it's taking care of people as if they are also a part of your community already so look changing reframing the way that we're viewing people re-entering right as not re-entering you're a part of our community like welcome back so yeah i like that great thank you all um i mean just I guess to summarize, I mean a lot of richness in there, and I'm sure won't do justice to it. But you know, doing holistic approaches that are multi-pronged, and I consider that the human uh, in, in in their entirety um, is how we get to a, a, a nation where everyone has high levels of digital literacy and able to use the tools, right? Because we can't forget these same digital tools are used to look for housing, right? They're used to look for jobs and create resumes and right and, and figure out what information is already out there about you that your you know your next uh, your next landlord might use to disqualify you right it's used to figure out what your credit score is right so whatever approach we use needs to consider um, the role technology plays uh, in all parts of our lives but also uh, trying to figure out these these basic needs right great um, question Hi, my name is Brittany and I um, grew up in Washington State. I work with the Multnomah County Public Libraries and part of the Black Cultural Advocacy Group there. Uh, one of the things that we're focusing on is programming and outreach that both centers our marginalized communities but makes our spaces inclusive, relevant, applicable to all of the things that you're saying in order to increase equity and empowerment in our communities. Um, I think one of the things that's so impactful to me listening to you speak is that so much of the work that you're talking about, these wraparound services are requiring small and nonprofits, but our institution is public and it's free and resource rich. And I guess what I wanna know from y'all, because I think the answer's in the room, is if you had an ask of your public spaces, like libraries, like any ask, what would it be that would help you do the work that you're trying to do what kind of like, I mean, is it spaces? Is it devices? Is it like mentors? Is it, what would be your ask of the spaces that are funded by the public already um, to help you do exactly what you're saying you need? I'm gonna say navigators, I think, and in, in the broadest sense of that, but I just know that having somebody that I, like that I didn't have to have, I didn't, like, th what she did was not, necessarily in her job title, but she literally walked me through every step. And it kind of, uh, when you have somebody there, it kind of puts, it put my mind at ease. Like, okay, well, if I have questions, I don't have to feel stupid by asking, going over here and work source does what for who, nothing for nobody, like in my perspective. And so having somebody that I can be, you know, have a conversation with and they know my situation and they know what I'm trying to attain, then it's like, it's a little relieving, especially, um, coming from where I came from and, that, and the, you, you can't trust too many people you, you know um, it, 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 that was the biggest thing for me having somebody that help you navigate but also that has hands and resources to the things that you need and they're not passing you off to three different people I'll say go over here and they send you somebody else and they send you somebody so um. for me I'll say uh, active uh, community outreach um, so the one issue I see in Yonkers is um, the public library, they have their own programming, right? That is duplicate services in a sense, right? Like resume building workshops that are focusing on employment. Um, why not bring in a, a, a grassroots organization that's already doing that work um, and join forces, right? So that, you know, it's not a competitive thing anymore, right? Like y'all coming together to, to do the same thing. So what happens is, and what I'm noticing with the public library, um, is that they have all these different services to put their name on those services, right, and kind of save their institution, which for me reflects the leadership. 
And I think the problem I'm seeing in Westchester is the vanguards must be removed because they come from a tri like an old school conservative. We need more contemporary, um, you know, fresh blood who is in tune with the community. A lot of individuals, um, and this speaks to probably a larger issue, is that the leadership are people who are from outside of my community. And I'm kind of tired of seeing that, right? We need a balance of people from within my community leading certain institutions, like a big place like the public library, so they don't have no like natural blind spots. Like I, I consider that natural blind spots. You know what I'm saying? So if you're from the community, you so you so in tune, you're gonna know about now for United doing this service. So why not have a community outreach team connecting with them, the churches, and all organizations to bring their services in here? Some of those play, uh, organizations may not have space, so now you're killing two birds in one stone. You know, so if that's a similar issue here. Like, I think just bringing that outreach, you know, increasing that and, and, and challenging the leadership if they have those blind spots. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so would you like to add in? No, I think that's great. Yeah, so awesome. Exactly. The idea of, like, reflectivity, too. Like, knowing that you can come into a space and maybe there's not somebody whose system is impacted that works there, mm -hmm. but there are people who are trained and they know. Um, so you don't feel odd when you come in and share your story or need to like ask for services yeah. that it's not like oh it's because you're this mm -hmm. you right. know? thank you we'll get to you in one moment uh, um, her question made me uh, it's connected to a question that I had here that I wanted to, to pose while we have this opportunity um, when you talked about the, uh, the the resources that you turn to I don't recall anyone of you talking about like going to any of your community-based organizations or your libraries um, and you said a word or two about work, work source but um, can you talk a little bit about why that uh, like maybe why they didn't that wasn't like a thought that came to mind when when it was time when you were struggling with with the use of digital tools and technologies well well for me personally um, prior to my incarceration I tried to um, get some assistance from some of these organizations like WorkSource or like Pioneer Human Services. But um, at 20 years old, right, at 21 years old, I don't even know how to ask for what I want or what I need. What I need, I don't even know what I need. And so I go to WorkSource, and so they're looking at me like, okay, we just have this kid here. He wants some help. And then they're telling me, oh, we can help you build a resume. But a resume only helps you in as much as you know how to apply it. Like, I can show you this piece of paper, but if I, if I don't have the skills to articulate what's on this paper or sell myself, it does me no good. So they're providing superficial services with no meat to the bone. Like, it's just like, oh, we did this, and they'll satisfy whatever. But the reality is there's no in-depth nobody that's there to really help you um, extract what you really need out of, out of some of those services. And that's been my experience with multiple services, so I don't even... Okay. So for me, um, we use this phrase a lot that the village, you know, it takes a village, but the village is disconnected, right? So we come home to a disconnected village, right? Parole needs you to do this, but they don't have no programs to send you to. Who's been my, when I first returned home three years ago, what helped me navigate was other formerly incarcerated people, because they had to do a program. And in my case, I had to go to another city, which was the Bronx, to take a mandated program because it wasn't available in Yonkers. Right. Um, so there wasn't no active out, like no marketing that was letting me know what was around, but they're getting funding for it as re-entry. Right. So I didn't even know about it. Um, there was no, uh, not many there like to pull from. Right. So that's what made me good on the front line with Now and Full United to be that person who is making it loud and clear that we are here to just navigate, help you get where you need to go and put those resources in front of you. You know, the biggest thing I've seen that, I wish I saw this with all organizations when COVID hit, we've seen so many health communities in the community with like, hey, take a COVID exam. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's outreach. I wish I seen this with West Hab and all these different housing, all these organizations doing that, bringing the resources to the community versus the community having to go look for the resources. Um, yeah, so we're trying to change that and we will. Cool, thank you. Um, um, I will say, so uh, my release was quite a bit different. I. Um, received clemency or commutation from the governor in Washington and as a part of going to the clemency board like I had to have a very very well articulated release plan um, which involved a lot of community organizers that um, that I had been affiliated with because of the school program that I helped start um, and then the Seattle clemency project another nonprofit so um, I had like four different organizations that all helped in some aspect mm. so like one person was able to get me a laptop one person mm. was able to like take me out to UW where I also go and walk around campus 
Um, one person was able to take me shopping and like teach me how to navigate the supermarket. Like they were little things. So like it might, it just meant that my family did not have to do everything. And that's what I mean when I say mutual aid, like that idea that everything doesn't have to be everything. So if you have all these like small niche components that there is someone there saying, here, we can help you connect all these things, then you don't feel like you're a burden to any one particular person. Um, but that you can access these things as you need them mm -hmm. and not necessarily like throwing them all at you uh, right away and saying here you go here's all your needs being met you might not even know like how to articulate your needs or how to use those things and you don't want that funding to like go to waste right yeah. so to give people agency to ask for or like think process through that before they're just like handed all these things yeah. it's kind of like having someone to think with Great. Thank it's you. important. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to highlight a few, a few comments that were made there that I think is important, particularly because most of you, uh, I believe many of you work at, um, at CBOs or public institutions. One, um, past experiences with organizations uh, tainted viewpoints of the ability of an organization to, to, to support um, one's needs. Um, even when they, even when the person know they had the needs, it still wasn't, it, you know, they were so tainted or so hurt uh, by past experiences, didn't feel like going back there. Um, and then two, uh, outreach, right, going to the communities, um, letting them, letting the community members know about the sort of services being available, but also treating the people in the community as if they're part of the community. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, community members can sense, you know, that, that sincerity and, and whether you're really trying to help them um, uh, or uh, improve their, their current situation. So, so thank you all for that. Do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. There's three, there's three questions. Okay. Yeah, I had a question too. So I just go there then. Yeah. Kind of a, maybe this question is more of a comment in a way. Um, uh, anyways, my name is Enrique. I had a, the pleasure of speaking with Jonathan yesterday. Um, yeah, so I think something that I've been hearing here, I mean, the outreach is good, but I think uh, from some of the folks in the room, just, I mean, here I am with another one of my colleagues over here, I don't really even know, uh, you know, from Multnomah County Library, right? And I do outreach into, like, the, the institutions. I'm a person that has a lived experience as well. I did five years, ten months in an Oregon facility. And I think there's a problem within institutions about, like, in-reach, right? Like with the library, we have so many resources, but we're so siloed and isolated that, I mean, <laughs> here's a resource here that, you know, this person could be utilizing, but we don't even know. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is, I mean, is how do we remedy those sort of things? I mean, and maybe it's not just a question for the folks on the panel, but the folks in the room as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, because like uh, the gentleman mentioned here, you know, every kind of institution wants to put their name on something, right? And then there's a lot of individuals within these institutions, you know, not that I'm, you know, free of that. You know, I'm an individual, I'm an institution, you know, I'm trying to work and trying to do my thing. But, you know, how do we stay more connected with each other, you know? Uh, maybe it's, like I said, maybe that's the question, I don't know, but any comments? I think it's kind of like what, he's, what he was talking about. Is, uh, it's the money really in the fight for the research. So you might, like my friend runs a nonprofit and he's in competition with other nonprofits. And so there's a, a natural clash when we're both running to get to the race, to the finish line first. And so, I mean, I, I couldn't tell you how to remember that, but I would yeah. think that it would start right there. Like how do we uh, pull the money or put organizations together in, in an effort to uh, have them collaborate collectively instead of fighting? I'll answer that by saying just organize. You have to organize. You know, do your research as an individual. What is going on with other public libraries? Because, you know, seeking information is your burden. On finding out what's going on, pulling resources, people together, and organizing, and then making noise from the bottom, you know, from the grassroots level to challenge the leadership to make them think differently. So why is there a disconnect between you and your colleagues, right? That's an infrastructural issue. So coming together, bringing people together, and making that noise challenge the status quo. That's the only change we are going to see is when we start from the grassroots level. Um, just logistically, too, there is a lot of problems with inreach. So thinking about, one, breaching the wall of a prison, like that idea of, like, 
being legitimized to actually enter the prison, offering services that you hope would like bridge from prison to community, but that there is a, at least in Washington, I don't know if this is a, like nationwide, but there is a really staunch rule that says like, if you're a volunteer here, there is no community connection out here. And so, depending on how your organization is run, like, you might have to funnel literally every interaction that you have with a person post-incarceration through a DOC officer, through prison administration, like, whatever that looks like. So there's so many points of, like, gatekeeping and control that, again, I t talk about state legislation or national legislation that says, like, we break down that barrier that says the people who you might know the best inside who have been like your volunteers or people that work for programs, nonprofits that exist inside of prison, like those are your network. You might, your, your family might be strangers to you, but you know these people because you've interacted with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So taking away the idea that that is somehow threatening the system mm -hmm. instead of like creating a really healthy transition that says, I still see this person regularly because that's who I feel safe with. That's who I've shared with. That's who... Like, that's what that connection looks like. Great, thank you. Uh, two more questions, and then uh, we're going to wrap it up. We have about 10 minutes left. Sure. Hi, I'm Meg Koifer from the STEM Alliance. I, I've had the privilege of partnering with Jonathan for a while now in Westchester County, and yet I come to a conversation like this and can only learn more. Um, and so I thank you so much for, you know, sharing your stories, for the vulnerability of that. Um, and it certainly seems like we are, the, you know, this is like the tip of the iceberg. We need you so much more. Um, and we need to have more conversations like this sponsored by NDAA specifically about this topic. Um, so I call on NDA for that. Um, but my question is, um, I really hear a lot of social, emotional, vulnerability, shame, struggle. And I just wanted to know whether it was a digital skills program or any program you worked in, what can folks who are trying to create programs learn about how to build a program that is going to fill in in these times of incredible social emotional trauma and stress? That's a big question. <laughs> Just naming that. That's a, that's, a, that's a big question. I mean, I mean, as simple as like, I do know that John had told us, like, we need breaks. Like, mm -hmm. our class was long. Mm -hmm. He's like, we need breaks. Like, it, it could be as simple as that. But what is a quality of a program that you experience where you're like, this little thing helped? For me, personally, um, and I still go through this, is um, I'm, I'm naturally, I don't speak to people. I naturally don't. Like, I'm about to graduate from UW next quarter, and I don't know anybody there. Because I go to class, and then I leave, and I go, like, and so for me, it's um, smaller, more personal circles because I don't, um, I just don't do well to tell the people. Like I could sit here and speak, and that's fine. But like if you're, if this is a different setting, I'm, it's weird to me. And so, um, and it's hella uncomfortable. <laughs> and so, um, thank you. Um, so having time to be, uh, to really look at somebody for who they are, and not like as a whole. Like this is a group of. Uh, this is an audience and everybody's watching, right? Now, this is a prisoner and these are all prisoners. They're, these are formerly incarcerated. Uh, and looking at me or another person individually definitely helps me feel more comfortable. Like, I've, yeah. When, like when I'm telling my story and I, uh, the last time I did that, I was just like, I felt abused. Like I really, it was the first time I ever told my story and I was just like, people were like, oh my God. And then I went home and I'm just like, People don't even know me, they don't give a fuck about me. Like, I don't, like, I went home and felt like crazy, and I had to stuff all this stuff back down that I went to. And so, having a person that actually talks to me and, like, cares about me or as a person does a lot more for me in, in terms of sharing my experiences and things like that, or being comfortable. I answer your question with three parts. Um, one is, Doing what you're already doing with us, being very accommodating with your flexibility, learning what's going to work for my participants, right? Um, being constantly open-minded, like what about the timing and stuff like that. Um, but one thing that I do know is just also continuously training your staff um, for everyone who's in, in his work on racial equity, right? Unconscious biases. Because um, sometimes the educator comes in the room and they already have this kind of like nose up in the air of, 
you know, I'm the authority, right? Mm -hmm. Changing that dynamic, you're here to learn as well. Every time you enter a new space, constantly train your staff that. Um, and then also think about how do you train and or, or, or find facilitators who are culturally adaptable, right? Um, and one of the um, cohorts I saw, I had to put one of the facilitators to the side and say, hey, um, in your next segment, like kind of read the room and maybe skip A because A is so rudimentary that they pass that. Like read your audience really well. Um, sometimes we come in with this education and we think that that's what it is, and but not really. Sometimes it's actually having the skill set to read people is another form of education that makes the classroom so much more appealing. So my participants, I'm there to kind of give them that comfortability and swoop in when I feel that they feel disconnected from the facilitator, right? Um, they might be some unconscious biases. Just for example, um, one of the facilitators was like, um, put your mask on. Like she's, and I pulled to the side, I said, listen, do not talk to the participants that way as if you're their mother. You know, these are grown men with lived experiences, fresh out of prison. Um, treat them as people. Hey, please, sir, can you put your mask, just as if you would speak to Governor Cuomo, right? Like, don't treat my participants different because you know they come from a different background. Um, and that goes into the kind of training and mindset um, as you're, you know, getting closer to this kind of work. And we'll always work on that, of course, but just being very mindful of that. Like, that's a key component. Um, yeah. Cool. No, that's excellent. Great. Um, do you want to pose your question? I, it, it's, uh, you know, I got worried about it being duplicative more than anything else, okay. but, but thinking practically, um, particularly that sort of transitional moment where, as you've expressed, hierarchy of needs, uh, you know, living, uh, working, et cetera, come first, and these things, you know, may go by the wayside. We've looked at things like wage replacement. So if you're in our class, you're getting paid to be in a class um, so that it, you may not have to make those choices. Is there anything else in sort of even that very practical vein when we're thinking about that moment that make it more possible, more practical, you know, it, more respectful in terms of how we are uh, approaching, you know, a, a population with some pretty specific um, bounds on their time and uh, a hierarchy to fill? To me, it sounds like that's a, I mean, for me coming out, that's a good basic start, especially how you articulate, like, a big thing is paying somebody to be in that space, right? So a lot of people, the first thing on my mind when I get out is, is money, obviously. I'm thinking about money because I need somewhere to stay and I need, uh, uh, I need a means to gain things. And so I think that's important, but uh, kind of in a small digression, I think, uh, the important part is trying to team, like, this is your program, and then how does this lead to a job, or how does this lead me to somewhere? Because ultimately, that's if you're trying to do better, you're, no matter where I'm at, I'm thinking in that direction. Right. So I think that's important. I think, too, like, if you reframe that, so if someone goes to college, they apply for financial aid. Like, and as a community, we totally accept this idea that this person, like, needs funding in order to be successful at this thing. And that includes, like, covering their housing. It also includes, like, personal expenses. Fun is, like, listed on there, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking about, like, if we're, if we're willing to accept that we help fund people having a successful educational mm -hmm. career, like, why not? You've already paid tons of tax money into having people mm -hmm. imprisoned. So why not think about that money or portions of that money also going to help them like live and sustain and get their feet on the ground? Like that, maybe that looks like just a couple months worth of something while people figure out like adapt, right? If you've been in prison for over a decade, like literally adapt to what does that look like to be free? And then like start to really formulate, what do I want to do? Because you've probably spent your amount of time that you've been incarcerated thinking about those things. But that doesn't mean that when you hit the ground running, like, that those things still exist or are apparent. Like, it's freedom is hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so it takes a lot of, like, support. And I'm really grateful. Like, I had a really good transition and a lot of support, but most people don't have that. So we really have to look at like who is the most vulnerable, what, how would they benefit, and having some sort of like financial security 
having mental health support, like having that holistic approach to it that's not stigmatized is, is really key. Yeah. So that you can think, okay, I can look at my phone and like navigate this because I know that I have a safe place to like go and sit and think about that. Yeah. Or somebody to be like, hey, I can help you ride the bus or I can help you do these things and use your phone at the same time, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. But you kept saying like your hierarchy of needs has to be met. And, and I think that's the big question is how do we do that? Yeah. So we're uh, coming up on time. I'm, I want to close up really quickly, but before I do that, I just wanted to. There are a few comments that were made. Um, points I want to uh, draw our attention back to. One was this fear about the 65 billion dollars, um, how that's going to be, be be spent. And I want to actually draw people's attention. So I didn't actually introduce myself that well at the beginning because I was wanted to make sure we got them in. But I'm Lasana Magasa. I'm a uh, postdoc at the University of Washington's Tech Policy Lab. Um, I grew up in New York and Harlem. Um, and one of the things that motivated me to do the work around like, digital inclusion was that in my neighborhood, so I, I went to a HBCU, a historical black college university in Virginia, got a degree in computer science, came back to my neighborhood. Everyone that was there when I left was still there doing the stuff they were doing. Um, they would come to me for financial aid, but I wanted to give them something that would, that, that lasts longer than the financial aid, right? Uh, and so I, I always encourage them to come with me uh, and I'll help them, you know, with resume, learn how to use a computer. Um, but it wasn't always uh, accepted and their objection was, well, I just got back. I don't got time to learn, right? Because the, the system doesn't allow me to make time to learn, right? Uh, and so we need to think about, about one, um, how do we create time for them to be able to learn and have their needs met? Two, uh, I, got a ML, I got my master's in library and information studies at Queens College in New York. Uh, my master's thesis was on, this was back in like 2000, on the, the presence of technology in prison libraries uh, across the country. There was very little, and there still is very little. But I bring that, and then my dissertation work at the University of Washington was around the digital literacy level of formerly incarcerated people. And uh, just something to highlight, one, there's a lot of talk about digital literacy and digital inclusion. There's, you know, presidents making speeches, there's money being spent. Very little of that money actually makes it to this particular marginalized community, right? Incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. Very little, if, if any, right? Uh, so we need, you know, if we're going to do this work and we're serious about serving this community, as someone mentioned earlier, we need to have more focused uh, uh, sessions at, at, at organizations like MDIA uh, that, that bring in people like the people on this panel um, and others who have lived experience to help uh, draw the, the roadmap, right, and to hold whoever is saying they're going to do it, to hold them accountable, right? The people with the lived experience are the ones who have the expertise to know if what is being said and what they say they're doing is actually being accomplished or not, mm -hmm. right? Um, then, two other things, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, oh, as it was mentioned, there is some level of technology being introduced into prisons, but if you do your research, uh, and which is part of what I'm doing now, is looking at uh, prison private public partnerships between prisons and private technology vendors, mm -hmm. right? Um, because, I mean, in many cases, there's something called like profit sharing, right? Um, in many cases, a lot of these private vendors are actually um, taking, eating all the costs for, for putting in the infrastructure, the technology and everything and saying it's free, but nothing is free, right? So we need to understand what's, 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 what's already happening if we're gonna um, bring in uh, interventions that are actually going to be successful, right? Prisons are saying they're scared of technology or scared of providing access, but they're working with these companies that are giving them kickbacks, right? So, like, what, like what's really going on, right? And then, um, Alyssa, you mentioned just recently that uh, you, you've been down, you were down a decade, right? And over. so when you come back, over a decade, right? And when you come back, you know, the, the world's been changed. I want to let you all know it doesn't have to be a decade. Right, we need to remember most people who are incarcerated at the time of incarceration, they had less than a high school degree, uh, a high school diploma, they were unemployed, right, and they were living um, uh, in poverty or under poverty. Right, so it doesn't have to be, a, it can be a year, right? The technology doubles every two years, right? So these, these changes happen very quickly. Um, in closing, I encourage you all to uh, 
to reach out to my panelists here. Their names are on, on the website. Um, and I mean, if you just want to quickly s say how people can get in contact with you, if they want to consult with you or bring you in to, to provide um, their institutions with, with, with services, if you can just list how people can get in contact with you. Sure, yeah. Um, I just have an email address, so I have LinkedIn, but I don't know how to use it. So still tackling that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, alnight at uw.edu. So any questions or if you just want to bounce ideas off. <laughs> uh, mine is Mr. Clark, that's M-R-C-L-A-R-K at uw.edu. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn at Jonathan Alvarez, or you can Google my name, Jonathan Alvarez, 914 United. A lot of work comes up there. Um, info at 914united.org is uh, the email you can reach me at, uh, united.com is the website. Um, please reach out, you know, hold me accountable as well. Um, I'm here to be a partner, even though I'm in New York. Um, I'm happy to be here, so please reach out. Yeah, and I also wanted to note, I don't have anyone on this panel representing uh, Portland or Oregon, and I do apologize for that. I did reach out uh, because there are people in this state with expertise as well and with lived experience, and they definitely should have been up here. Um, but I was un unable to secure anyone ahead of, of this, uh, this session. So thank you all for coming, and enjoy the rest of your, your conversation.